is Robert Montgomery speaking. From the nation's capital has come a new epic of American courage and sacrifice, America's greatest adventure in polar exploration. This is a tale of men and of their willingness to endure hardship and risk life above and beyond the call of duty in the service of country and humanity. For brevity, the sequence of events has occasionally been rearranged. The President's Cabinet approved the expedition. As Secretary of the Navy, James V. Forrestal explains the reasons for the enterprise. There is only one untouched reservoir of raw materials left in the world, and that's in the region known as Antarctica, an area larger than the combined area of the United States and Europe. The American government is sending a naval expedition to that region. The purpose is to train our Navy in polar operations so that it may better perform its function of preserving the peace upon the seven seas of the world. Beyond that, the American government is seeking to do its share in the discovery and the release to the world of the unknown treasures of Antarctica in the interests of all mankind. Thumbs up to this, gentlemen. The Secretary has approved our plans, confirming you, Admiral Byrd, as the officer in charge of the expedition, and you, Admiral Cruzen, as the task force commander. And we get everything we need. That makes Operation High Jump the greatest polar expedition in history. Admiral, time is going to be our greatest handicap. By the time we get through this very difficult ice pack, the summer will have ended, and the fall will have set in. Never before has anyone attempted to take a fleet of thin-skinned steel ships through 300 miles or more of crushing ice pack. I have great faith in your skill, courage, and determination. And now, gentlemen... Admiral Nimitz reviews the operation's plan. The expedition will comprise three groups a central land plane group to explore the interior from Little America, and two seaplane groups, the eastern to map that half of the continental shoreline, and the western to map the opposite coast of Antarctica. After the original orders have been issued, three months of planning are needed to organize the giant venture. This is Robert Taylor speaking. At the world's greatest naval base, Norfolk, Virginia, ships of the central and eastern group are loading. The flagship, Mount Olympus, equipped with powerful radio and radar, will serve as the leader's voice of command. Admirals Byrd and Cruzen come aboard to check staff preparations, food, fuel, and clothing for 4,000 men. Byrd greets staff officers who have fitted out the expedition. Not a few vessels, but a fleet. Officers and men, not hundreds, but thousands, and pilots by the score. The chief of staff, Captain Quackenbush, calls up the fleet's youngest recruits to meet the admirals, who name them Running Jump and High Jump. The pups are unimpressed by rank. Running Jump and High Jump are first arrivals from the Chinook Kennels at Wanalancet, New Hampshire, where sailors are learning the art of navigating dog sleds. Everything happens to sailors. But soon they come to understand and to love the huskies. They watch their dogs carefully to see that they have enough to drink and enough to eat, and always at the right time. Dog Watch Blue Jackets practice the patient care that will keep the dogs in prime form, not only food, daily attention to their eyes so that they may not suffer the dreaded Arctic snow blindness, and the inevitable vitamin pills. But even dogs can't escape these days of ABCD health. The boys learn all the tricks, tickling of the throat, and a pat on the nose gets the pills down. The dog sleds are the small boats of the Antarctic. Each carries 600 pounds with 10 dogs hauling. Each dog's harness is tailor-made, carefully fitted to avoid the chafing that has been fatal to many a sled dog at below zero temperatures. The husky's paws are equally important. There are canine snowshoes precisely notched for the pulling claws. In cut-down auto chassis, the sailor drivers finish training. Huskies so often have meant life itself to Admiral Byrd that he calls them his Antarctic Life Insurance Company. From Norfolk, 
Admiral Cruzen sails aboard the Mount Olympus. His crews are a cross-section of the country's manhood. Admiral Byrd will follow later in a carrier, Philippine Sea. The Coast Guard icebreaker, North Wind, powerful plow horse of the expedition, backs out. The seaplane tender, Pine Island, is first to stand out to sea. Steaming south via the Panama Canal, the fleet must cover 12,000 miles to reach Antarctica. At the 100th meridian west, the groups are to separate, and the central group proceed to a rendezvous point at Scott Island. This is Van Heflin speaking. Sailing day at San Diego finds the Western Group helicopters practicing final pinpoint landings on the newly installed helicopter flight deck of the seaplane tender Curry Tuck. They are to serve as eyes of the fleet when it buffets through the pack ice, and when need be, to go on rescue missions. For exploration, three Martin Mariners called PBMs with a flight range of 3,000 miles are spotted aboard the Curry Tuck. Ships of the Western Group will proceed 10,000 miles south to the Balleny Islands, 860 miles to the west of Little America. Wearing the whiskers of Neptunus Caninus, Ricky, the veteran husky, presides as the pups become doggy shellbacks. The oncoming shadow of the Antarctic intensifies preparations. Bamboo is split for trail marker sticks. These, topped with flags, will form lifelines to guard the men against losing the trail in blinding blizzards. Small details, but vitally important in the wilderness of ice. The dogs are inoculated against infection. Now the serious business of the sea takes over. Danger menaces the fleet oiler, Cacapon. She must fuel the fleet now to lighten her cargo of four million gallons of oil. If storms strike her, plates may warp, rivets shear, and her back may be broken. And ahead are the dreaded Roaring Forties. He's run with polling lines, bringing over the Cacapon's captain for a conference. The ships are still on course, forging ahead. But the Cacapon's salty skippers smell storm coming. Few ships travel this lonely ocean, so there are no weather reports. We've got to finish this job fast, he roars, or we'll be caught in a stiff blow. And blow she does. Flashes word by radio to the carrier Philippine Sea. Base ready, weather suitable. On the carrier, six planes, triple checked, are ready for their moment of destiny. Admiral Byrd has given the pilots a final briefing. Everything depends on split second timing. Pilots, man your plane. No 3,000 foot runway here. Only a scant 300 feet. Jet propulsion is their reliance. Crewmen attach jet containers, four to a plane. These JATO bottles are packed with flaming power. In the critical 10 seconds of takeoff, they give the kick up of two added engines. Bird is airborne in exactly 100 feet. Bird and his companion plane will try the 800-mile flight first. The others await his orders. At Little America, cameramen and Admiral Cruzen wait anxiously. And there comes Bird. Cruzen can relax now. The skis work perfectly. The carefully calculated drag of the wheels serves only to shoot up a plume of snow. Bird greets his son, Dickie Jr., first, here following Dad's footsteps. They watch plane number two come in safely. Bird tells Cruzen, good to be home again. But Cruzen has urgent news. There's a terrific storm brewing, only ten hours more of safe flying. 
Bird radios the carrier, launch all planes as soon as possible. By midnight, the Philippine Sea has the remaining four planes ready. They must risk a takeoff in darkness before the terror of the storm strikes. over the pack ice. With frozen death below and weather closing in, navigation becomes tricky. This close to the pole, the magnetic compass is no help. At the base, men scan the gray skies, looking, and finding only the blackness of the approaching storm now visible to the east. If the planes don't make it within an hour, but in they come, one by one, to land in the last remnants of clear light. Each landing is the first on the ice for each pilot. These men are the first ever to fly big planes into the Antarctic. Or on previous expeditions, the planes were freighted in, assembled, and only then were they flown. These Navy and Marine Corps flyers have been bred on stormy going. Their long experience and, above all, the Navy's relentless training in all details brings them in, but with little time to spare. The blizzard hits 100 miles an hour scouring across the Sestrugi. In storms such as this, many brave explorers have died. ventilating hatch. 
It stood 20 feet in the air when it was put up 12 years before. He pokes a stick up as a marker for the main hatch. Now all hands, the Admiral included, will have a chance to go look-see. Below, the old-timers find a lantern that lights at once. No manner of other gear. For here in Antarctica, there is no decay, no rust, no dust, not even germs. Fruits, vegetables, meats, all good after 17 years. Small wonder bird preaches that one day, Antarctica may be the world's storehouse to keep the seven years surplus for the seven lean years. Bird bringing with him the old corn cob he'd forgotten in 1930 comes up last. He meets heavy going, but he makes it the hard way and seems to like it. Can men survive in freezing water? Men from Mars, members of a special underwater demolition team, wear the new cold water rubber survival suit. In contrast to these skylarking youngsters eating ice cream in the ice, men in ordinary clothing are paralyzed in six minutes and die very quickly thereafter. Yet these sailors, wearing only underwear beneath their survival suits, stay in half an hour and come up chipper and warm. On the sunny afterdeck of the Mount Olympus, the expedition's prize penguin catch, the big emperors, are living the life of penguin rallies. They grow four feet tall, weigh up to 80 pounds, and are the only creatures who live throughout the year on Antarctica. Eons ago, they flew. In time, their wings evolved into swimming fins. Their deep feathers are the warmest known. Their feet, thick leather-like pads. On these, they lay their single egg and tuck it up within the body feathers for warmth, to hatch it. In captivity, they must have their vitamins. Keeping them alive for the return voyage is quite a problem, for their bloodstreams have no germ resistance. Their necks are ball-bearing. Strangely enough, the smaller captive penguins prefer their fish fillets. They won't eat live fish out of a pail. The rockhopper penguins are the clowns of the Antarctic. Twenty inches high, cocky yellow eyebrows, sassy, and forever hungry. As the men find out, they'll eat their weight in fish every three days. The gathering of scientific data ranks high in expedition plans. Admiral Byrd says goodbye and good luck to an over-ice expedition which is to probe deep into the Rockefeller Mountains, 300 miles southeast. Two LVTs hauling supply sledges strike out into the white darkness. Their mileage, checked by bicycle wheel counters, astern. In the mountain rocks, they will seek minerals and ancient petrified vegetation. Hourly, they will record important aerological data. But exploration by plane has priority one. A million and a half square miles are to be explored and mapped, and the oncoming winter soon will end flying weather. The wheels come off. But both takeoffs and landings on the ice must be made by skis alone. Delicately balanced to feather in the wind, yet strong to stand the shattering shock of landings. Organized exploration on a scale hitherto undreamed of calls for precision timing. Each plane is serviced on exact schedule with 1,200 gallons of high test gas and with preheated oil tested to function at 80 below. A pressure tank, especially designed for operations in deep cold, pumps the oil into the planes. Daily flights begin. Each plane has a definite sector to explore, a definite timetable, a definite radio report schedule. While the weather holds, flights operate around the clock. For emergencies, the LVTs cache provisions and fuel at the limit of their range. Two aviators forced down, two rescue planes sent out to bring them in, these cairns may offer the one hope and may mean ultimate survival. 1,200 miles to the east, the eastern group vessels and planes are exploring the mysterious Phantom Coast. Aboard the destroyer Monson, the commander of the eastern group, Captain George Dufek, makes an exploration voyage. He sails close in to Mount Erebus, 14,000 feet above the sea. It is the only known active volcano near the South Pole. Captain Dufek, his mission accomplished, returns to rendezvous with the seaplane tender Pine Island. Personnel transfers to the destroyer must be made by breaches buoy because of rough seas. This officer would probably prefer a boat. The deep roll and the destroyer's outward flaring bow 
force the handling crew to wait for the exact moment to haul inboard, lest the man be dashed against the ship's side and killed. It is Captain Dupac's turn next. The line is set higher. The seas run stronger. The ships roll dangerously apart. The line slacks, then snaps taut and breaks. A 50-foot plunge downward. Dupac disappears. Jump to stations. Lower away. Hurry, hurry. Eight minutes in this icy water means death. Speed is the only hope. Boat shears clear. Heads out fast to the rescue. Captain Dupec reappears. He has managed to inflate his life jacket. Seven minutes gone. Dupec grabs the lifeline. The seaman clutches him. By a margin of seconds, he is safe. 1,500 miles west of Little America, the Currituck and her western group are off the Shackleton Ice Shelf, circling the Sunset Coast. The western group commander, Captain Vaughn, gives pilots and plane crews a last briefing on Antarctic dangers and the technique of survival if forced down. The flight about to start is the longest and most important so far for the western group. Before takeoff, survival gear is checked. Gear to keep nine men alive for 100 days. Food, drugs, sleds, sleeping bags. On the water, the great TBM makes her takeoff run. Her jet assist bottles blast. She lifts quickly into the air and circles the Kuratuk once. Jet assist bottles, their work done, are dropped and make a salvo splash. The pilot, Commander David E. Bunger, wipes his frosted windshield, a constant source of trouble in polar flying. He is over the Shackleton Ice Shelf, named for the great English explorer who kept returning to the Antarctic until death so often escaped, kept its rendezvous with him. The smooth shelf roughens, dark rocks, called nunataks, appear above the ice. Then rugged mountain ranges as far as the eye can see. Bunger leans forward in amazement. His eyes have caught a sudden and unbelievable change in scenery. The universal white has turned to chocolate brown dotted with blue. A cameraman goes into action. 300 square miles of land without snow. Land that might be in New Mexico or Arizona. Pictures alone will prove Bunger has discovered a warm oasis in the shadow of the pole. It is for such supreme moments as this that men brave the hardships of exploration. The astounding, undreamed-of fact is that they are over a chain of warm-water lakes whose shores, except for small patches, are free of ice and snow. Commander Bunger circles the largest lake in sight, five miles long. He comes in to make a landing. Water temperatures must be recorded. Samples taken. He finds the water fresh, the temperature 38 degrees Fahrenheit. On the shores are vast deposits of coal and of minerals of the utmost importance to civilization. Aside from their headline discovery, Bunger and his men have another good reason for hustling home to the Currituck. At Little America, a warning sounds. The fleet is in sudden danger. It is being frozen in. It may be locked within the Bay of Wales. Here is the treacherous foe. If caught, the ships will be wedged against the barrier, crushed. Here will be the graveyard of the fleet. to loosen the ice around the ships so propellers may turn without shearing off. One by one, the ships are cleared, yet underway. Bird remains behind with 197 volunteers in grave problems. His most important exploration flights will now lack the powerful directional radio of the Mount Olympus. To get his men out, he must hope the icebreaker can crash her way back in time. Otherwise, he and his men will be frozen in for the nine sunless months of the dark, treacherous Antarctic winter. Marooned, Admiral Byrd and his staff plan the big flight to the South Pole and far beyond. This is the culmination, the last mass flight. Four planes spanning out over a continent of unknown territory larger than Texas, California, and Arizona combined. Over freezing wastes without people, without life, without vegetation. 
nature's most formidable challenge to man. The four planes are gassed up, all controls triple-checked, motors heated, for they face cold as extreme as 60 below, unrelenting, murderous. Photographic units lead the parade of science to the planes. Each is a flying laboratory. The cameras are the trimetrigons and the K-17s that spied out enemy secrets during the war. Now each plane carries 250 pounds of film to record some of nature's last great mysteries. The war's secret radar magnetic detectors are here too, bolted on like bombs. In war, their electronic impulses spotted minefields buried deep under the surface. Now they will read far below the ice, detect and identify minerals, coal, iron, precious ores. Bird gets the words, ready, sir. He boards the leading plane. Gives the command, take off. Crews hasten to rock the ships and thus free the skis frozen to the ice. Now all the work that has gone before, the planning, the task of preparing ships, of training men, the perilous voyage through the ice, now all of these investments of time and sometimes of suffering are coming to focus. Takeoffs for non-stop flights over the desolate, danger-studded wastes of Antarctica. Flights of great distance, the equivalent of, back at home, winging non-stop from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. Aviation is all important in the Navy's Antarctic exploration. Just as aviation is all important in a modern Navy that must be strong under and above the sea, as well as on it. We'll be right back with... The shelf ice, Bird leads his four planes in the long climb over pressure ridge areas, heading for the polar plateau. 10,000 feet up. Below are no landing fields, only deep crevasses. Pressure ridge is 100 feet high. Instant destruction for a plane forced down. Bird pioneered the first South Pole flight in 1929. He applies again the practice of constant vigilance, careful calculations that assured his earlier successes. Over this cruel country, Bird flies today at three miles a minute. In earlier explorations, three miles in one day was frequently the utmost for Shackleton and Scott for Britain, Amundsen for Norway, and Byrd himself for America. The Beardmore Glacier, 200 miles long, 50 wide, a thousand feet deep, who knows? Byrd checks position by the sun compass. The glacier signals the South Pole itself. Here, Byrd drops the flags of the United Nations, carefully boxed, a symbol of America's goodwill to all nations. Now beyond the pole, Bird focuses his cameras and magnetic detectors on land new to him and to all mankind. In eastern group waters, the seaplane tender Pine Island swings out a plane. Listed on the fleet's roster as Mariner George One. Crew members look out. No shadow of coming disaster troubles their young faces. Captain Caldwell, observer. Lieutenant J.G. Frenchy LeBlanc, pilot in command. Lieutenant J.G. Bill Kearns, co-pilot. Ensign Lopez, navigator, and a crew of five take off to map the treacherous phantom coast. Birds planes deep into the unknown are the eyes of civilization, recording, evaluating, mapping. Plateaus, mountain ranges with peaks 20,000 feet above sea level. The trimetric on lenses clicking overlapping exposures every three seconds Photograph from horizon to horizon. Coal, a mountain of coal. Bird later declares Antarctic mines, if once tapped, could supply the world's coal needs for centuries. These official motion pictures can give only a cross-section of the miles of photographic records accumulated on this expedition by the Navy. The exposed mapping film will take five years to assemble. Amplifying these are the radar magnetic detectors accurately recording mineral discoveries of immense value for the future use of all mankind. England, Norway, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, South American countries, and Soviet Russia are claiming Antarctic territory. The United States recognizes no claim, and so far has made no formal claims for itself. But international policies cannot concern the Admiral now. His duty is to keep his flying laboratories functioning to fulfill his dream of a lifetime. The word gas half gone, sir, comes from the engineer tabulating fuel tank readings. 
Bird radios his pilots, return to base. By the third leg of their triangular course, the planes head back for Little America. Bird's plane takes the widest swing fuel permits as the lenses of the TriMets continue recording new territory. This is the last big flight. Bird is determined to record the maximum possible. One by one, the planes swing in over Tent City. Flight operations checks the men and safely down. Plane two, plane three, plane four. But not plane one. Bird's plane is yet to be accounted for. Bird is missing. Out over the ice, Bird is in trouble. His starboard engine is cutting out. Now stops. His one remaining engine is losing power. The altimeter needle starts dropping down. The plane is losing altitude. All 4D1 to base. All 4D1 to base. Position Q5. Engine out. Losing altitude. The base prepares for rescue operations. with a partial power of one engine, the plane is in jeopardy. Down she drops. The needle drops from 3,000 feet down, threatening peaks around her. A further drop might mean a crash. Only one hope, reduce the load, lighten her at once. Maybe that way, maybe if enough weight goes, maybe she will hold. Already the mountains are above. She is deep in the valley, deep in the shadow of disaster. The needle drops downward from 1,700 feet. Precious films and records are saved. The gamble is life or death. The altimeter levels off at around 900 feet. Slowly she starts to climb. She is gaining altitude. Pilot signals. Oro. Oh. Three hours later, at the base, crippled plane comes into sight. Men peer closely, tense, hushed, as they see the starboard prop dead. The one engine landing is tricky at best. With skis, on ice, hold your fingers crossed for the pilot. Safe! Safe! Good going! The greatest exploration flight of all history has ended in success. The flight beyond the South Pole. The flight beyond imagination. But over the Pine Island with the Eastern Group is the shadow of tragedy. Captain Dufek flashes the word by radio. To Eastern Task Group. From Task Group Commander. Mariner George 1, overdue. This group commence standard search and rescue operations immediately. Grim men with grave news from Captain Dufek. No time now for jubilation over his own escape. No mood for rejoicing. Bird knows better than any man the tragic import of the message. In the freezing danger of the Antarctic, seconds are hours. Minutes are days. Every resource of the expedition must be mobilized instantly. All planes must take the air. All men stand alert for emergency duty. Over the ice pack, above the open sea, across the barrier. Mariner George 1 is down with men. No radio signals coming through. That means a crash. Search. Search! Search! Wherever the plane is, it must be found. For maddening, anxious days, fog shrouds the area where the accident most likely took place. Men are frantic. Yet daily, at their own request, at their urging, in fact, the crew of the Pine Island gathers for prayer service. On the 13th day, the weather breaks clear. Captain Dufek sends another PBM into the area heretofore shrouded in fog. At last, in clear visibility, the pilots and men scan water and pack ice along the Phantom Coast. Wherever they are, the nine men of the George One have been lost almost two weeks. Hope is thin. Five hours out, Commander Howell, the pilot, spots smoke. A signal fire. Some are alive down there. How badly hurt? How many live? George One smashed. The wreckage scattered, some of it burned and a message on the wing. Lopez, 
Henderson, Williams, dead. No seaplane can land on the ice. Can the survivors reach open water? Powell must drop a message. We'll land Barrier's Edge 10 miles north. We'll drop flags to mark trail. If you can walk it, form circle. If not, form line. Powell knows the gravity of the decision Captain Caldwell must reach. But if the men can walk, a day may be saved. A precious day for the engine. Powell flashes the news. Captain Dufek gets the word and gives it to the Pine Island by loudspeaker. Attention all hands. This is the task group commander speaking. Mariner George 1 has been sighted. Rescue operations are in progress. Powell circles his PBM over the wreckage. He watches for his answer. The huddle of men breaks apart. They've reached a decision. It's a circle. They'll try the 10-mile trek to board the PBM at the water's edge. Powell's crew have the relief gear ready now for the men below. Cargo chutes float the heavy packages down. First aid boxes, rations, skis, blankets. For men hungry, cold, hurt, and losing hope, the chutes are as lovely as shining stars. Symbols of life restored, of return to families who've been waiting and praying. Now to mark the trail. The PBM's crew have hundreds of flags, each weighted to land and stay upright. If fog should again close in on this desolate coast, there must be no second disaster, no wandering from the road to rescue. The survivors follow the trail markers. Five able to walk, one on a sled, ten miles to go. These men are marching out of the shadow of death into the sunshine of life. Aboard the rescue plane, ready to leave the barrier edge, the survivors, six thankful men, jerk out their story in bits and flashes. How Henderson, Lopez, and Williams died in the crash and explosion when they smashed up in milk bowl visibility. How they found scattered cans of food, a stove, and fuel to keep it going. And one tube of sulfur tablets, just enough to keep Frenchy LeBlanc, their gravely injured pilot, barely alive. Proudly, they tell how Captain Caldwell consulted them all in dividing their little food, how he kept watch, inspired their faith, and how they prayed, as men always do, when there is no other hope but prayer. Bill Kearns, co-pilot, grins hello. First off is Frenchy LeBlanc. Corman carried him tenderly in a stoked stretcher. War and Robbins pulled him out of the blazing nose of the plane, but his back, hands, and face suffered third-degree burns, and in the Gethsemane of waiting for rescue, both legs were frozen to the knees. Amputation is inevitable, but he will live. The ship's company of the Pine Island greets their skipper, Captain Caldwell, observer on the flight. He says no ship ever looked so good to him as his own command, as again he sets foot on her decks. His executive officer greets him with sincere affection. Captain Dufek warmly welcomes the survivors. Co-pilot Kearns, his broken arm in a sling. McCarty, photographer. War, the radio operator. And smiling Shorty Robbins, the motorman. The head is warm, a hot bath, clean sheets, and long hours of restoring sleep. News of the rescue finds the icebreaker with Admiral Cruzen fighting her way through thickening ice to pick up Admiral Byrd and his men at Little America. Byrd is radioed for all speed. At the base, the Admiral supervises Operation Secure. All essential records and scientific instruments are to be taken home. The planes must remain. They are stripped down with the hope that another American expedition in a future year may find them of use. Supply dumps are marked by poles. And now through the capes comes the old reliable workhorse, the icebreaker. Final loading is the order. All roads lead to the bay, the last trip down. The last long trek through the snow for the big go-devil sledges loaded with men and equipment. The excitement that always comes with sailing infects all hands, including the dogs. They sniff something important is in the wind. With normal quarters for 75, the icebreaker must jam aboard the additional 197 men of the base party until after the voyage north, she can transfer personnel to the big ships awaiting her at Scott Island. Bird is among the last aboard. He can now report to Admiral Nimitz, Operation High Jump completed. 
Our men have achieved accomplishments unparalleled in the history of discovery. Our central group has flown far beyond the South Pole, mapped one-third million square miles never before seen by man. Our eastern group mapped 3,000 miles of Phantom Coast and charted 40,000 square miles of coastal ocean areas hitherto unknown. Our western group, flying hundreds of air hours, mapped the 4,000-mile Sunset Coast, made the amazing discovery of warm land in Antarctica. In all, the expedition explored more than a million and a half square miles. Our scientists, by use of the radar magnetic detector, have pinpointed fabulous treasures and resources of great significance for all mankind. The men who did the job, Navy, Army, Air Corps, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and scientists, are going home. Tired men. They're going home to their mothers, sweethearts, wives, children. Home, strong in the knowledge that they have met the Antarctic Battalion and conquered. Well done.